Good evening. It's Thursday, October 17th. I'm Max Pringle with Scott Bamba. Coming up, the Israeli military confirms that it has killed Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar in an attack in southern Gaza. Vice President Harris campaigns and holds three rallies today in Battleground, Wisconsin. The U.S. strikes targets in Yemen aimed at Houthi rebels. And Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addresses his parliament today. These stories and more coming up from the studios of KPFA in Berkeley. I'm Max Pringle with Scott Baba. This is the Pacifica Evening News. U.S. officials are welcoming news of the death in Gaza of Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar. Israel confirmed the death of Sinwar in southern Gaza today. President Biden called it a good day for the U.S., Israel, and the world and indicated that a pathway to returning the hostages Hamas still holds and ending the war still lies ahead. Sagar Magani has more. The U.S. is hailing Israel's killing of Hamas's top leader. Yahya Sinwar was one of the architects of Hamas's deadly assault on Israel last year. President Biden compares Sinwar's death to the feeling in the U.S. after Osama bin Laden was killed. And the world is better now that he's gone. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, moments after Vice President Harris said Sinwar's killing provides an opening. An opportunity to finally end the war in Gaza. Sullivan says Sinwar was a massive obstacle to peace. More interested in causing mayhem and chaos and death than in actually trying to achieve a ceasefire and hostage deal. And the administration says there is now an opportunity for a day after in Gaza without Hamas in power. Sagar Megani, Washington. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel has, quote, settled to settled its account with Yahya Sinwar and called on Hamas to surrender after the death of its leader. The elimination of this leader, Hamas will not lead Gaza. This is an opportunity for you, people of Gaza, to be freed from Hamas. And from the uh, to the terrorists of Hamas, I say that your leaders are running away and they will be eliminated one by one and those who will surrender and also release our captives will remain alive. Netanyahu emphasized that though Sinwar is dead, the war has not ended. Besides seeking the release of hostages, Netanyahu has said Israel must keep long-term control over Gaza to ensure Hamas does not rearm, opening the possibility of continued fighting. There was no immediate confirmation from Hamas of Sinwar's death. For Hamas, losing Sinwar would be a major blow, but the group has shown resilience throughout the conflict. Sinwar himself only led the militant group since August, after Hamas's former leader, Ishmael Haniyeh, was killed in an explosion in July during a visit to Iran, an incident blamed on Israel. In Palestine, reactions to the news of Sinwar's death were mixed. Umm Mohammed, a displaced Palestinian in Deir al-Balah, expressed hope that with Sinwar's death, Israel might relent in its assault on the Gaza Strip. There is no reason left for them to continue the war any longer. When we heard the news of Sinwar, it is true that we were sad for him, but at the same time, we were happy that the war could end. There it is. They achieved their goals. What more goals do they have? Do they have more than that? Enough. We want to go back. I hope the war stops so I can just return to Gaza. But displaced Palestinian Ahmad Hamduna said that ultimately Sinwar's death changed nothing. The killing of the martyr Commander Abu Ibrahim is a tragedy for the Palestinian people, as he is responsible for the country, responsible for the negotiations, and head of the Hamas movement. But it will not affect the interests of the country. After the leader, a thousand leaders will come, and after the man, a thousand men will come. 
President Joe Biden said he planned to speak with Netanyahu and other Israeli leaders to discuss the pathways for ending the war, quote, once and for all. Vice President Kamala Harris headed to Wisconsin today as part of a whirlwind tour this week through the so-called Blue Wall states of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, which the Democrat is hoping to shore up with just three weeks to go before Election Day. Harris said Donald Trump's recent remarks about January 6th show his values are out of line with democracy. And what did Donald Trump say last night about January 6th? He called it a, quote, a day of love. But, but it points out something that everyone here knows. The American people are exhausted with his gaslighting. A loss in any of the blue wall states, which refers to the state's status as traditional Democratic Party territory, could doom Harris's presidential bid. She held three events today in Wisconsin. She met with students at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee before holding two rallies later in the day. She'll attend three events in Michigan tomorrow. Meanwhile, President Trump is delivering remarks at a charity dinner in New York City tonight. Reports of intimidating text messages targeting Wisconsin college students and recent graduates are prompting more voting rights outreach to young voters. Judith Ruiz Branch reports. The anonymous text message warns recipients about voting in a state where they are not eligible and says they could be fined or jailed for violating Wisconsin state law. Molly Carmichael is a recent graduate who works with the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. She said the first thing she noticed when she got the text was the harsh language. Right off the bat, um, you know, I was pretty upset because I figured this was also going out to um, other people, maybe people who have never voted before and are excited to vote this November, and so getting a text like that would certainly be really alarming. The League of Women Voters, along with Free Speech for People, petitioned the Wisconsin and U.S. Departments of Justice to investigate the matter. Carmichael says they've also started a digital campaign promoting the election protection hotline, trying to counter the harmful text with positive and correct information and resources. Another voting rights organization, Common Cause Wisconsin, is also joining forces. Executive Director Jay Heck says interfering with the student vote is nothing new for Wisconsin and is almost expected in the swing state. Students become a very convenient target for many of the people that are trying to undermine public confidence in voting uh, in Wisconsin. Heck says the state's strict photo ID law for voters may add confusion to the process for some college students whose school IDs may not be compliant with state law. Common Cause has a section on its website that outlines what college students need to vote in Wisconsin, including detailed examples of which IDs are permitted. While continued outreach to college students is critical after this latest scheme, Heck says, he's hopeful most students won't fall for it. The good thing about it is I think younger people, by and large, I think are less susceptible to some of this stuff that they see in the texts that they get because they're just more used to social media. And I think a lot of them are probably a little more savvy about whether it's, it's, it's true or not. Students who receive this type of text message or any other intimidating voting-related communications are encouraged to report it to the Election Protection Hotline at 866-OUR-VOTE. For Public News Service, I'm Judith Ruiz Branch. A Virginia elections official who faced criminal charges that were later dropped over a botched vote count in the 2020 presidential election is suing the state attorney general, accusing him of malicious prosecution. Michelle White filed the lawsuit today in federal court. She says she was wrongly vilified in the only criminal prosecution brought by Republican Attorney General Jason Miyari's Election Integrity Unit. Her suit seeks unspecified monetary damages. Miyare's indicated White in 2022 on charges including neglect of duty for errors in Prince William County's 2020 vote count. It was later revealed the county shorted Joe Biden and it overreported Donald Trump's count. Miyare's office has not commented on the litigation. 
Voters in Wisconsin will be asked to approve a state constitution amendment this fall that would forbid city governments from allowing non-citizens to vote in local elections. The proposed amendment is on the November 5th ballot despite substantial evidence that it's rare for foreign citizens to vote illegally in the United States. Current law already bans non-citizens from voting in Wisconsin elections for state or federal offices. Catherine Carley reports. University of Wisconsin law professor Bree grossi Wildy says a state constitutional amendment to ban non-citizen voting is scary and unnecessary. There's a lot of deterrent for non-citizens to not vote in Wisconsin. It would be very risky on a lot of dimensions for non-citizens to decide to vote. Seven other states have taken up similar measures, but it's already illegal for non-citizens to vote in federal elections. And in spite of the conspiracy theory, it almost never happens. I'm Catherine Carley for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. The United Nations said it has detected its first case of cholera in northern Lebanon sparking fears of an outbreak amongst those displaced by the war. Since the start of intense fighting in southern Lebanon, many people have fled to the northern parts of the country. According to official U.N. data, some 1.2 million people have so far been displaced in Lebanon. Jody Jacobs has more. The World Health Organization says a response plan has been activated to strengthen its surveillance, contact tracing and water sampling in Lebanon. But this has been interrupted by the ongoing fighting. WHO Director General Tedros Ghebreyesus telling correspondents that they tried to prevent any outbreak of cholera, having launched an oral vaccination drive back in August already. The World Health Body has expressed concerns that many of those who had fled the violence in the south of Lebanon had no protection from cholera, a disease that strives in poor water and sanitary conditions. Jody Jacobs, New York. U.S. long-range B-2 stealth bombers launched airstrikes targeting underground bunkers used by Yemen's Houthi rebels. It wasn't immediately clear what damage was done in the strikes. However, it's incredibly rare for the B-2 spirit to be used in the strikes targeting the Houthis, who've been attacking ships for months in the Red Sea corridor over the Israel-Hamas war in the Gaza Strip. Pentagon spokesman Brigadier General Pat Ryder told reporters that the strike demonstrates that the U.S. takes threats to commercial shipping in international waters seriously. It also sends a clear message to the Houthis that there will continue to be consequences for their illegal and reckless attacks, which put innocent civilian lives and U.S. and partner forces' lives at risk. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the B-2 bombers targeted underground weapons storage locations in Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. The U.S. gave no assessment of the damage from the strikes, The Red Sea has become a battlefield for shippers since the Iranian-backed Houthis began their campaign targeting ships traveling through the waterway, which once saw $1 trillion of cargo pass through it yearly. The Houthis have attacked dozens of ships and have killed at least four sailors. They claim they're targeting ships linked to Israel, the U.S., and the United Kingdom. U.N. experts today accuse the two sides in Sudan's civil war of using starvation tactics against 25 million civilians. They said the war has left 97 percent of the population facing severe levels of hunger. War has raged since April of last year between the Sudanese army, under the control of the de facto ruler Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, and the Paramilitary Rapid Support Forces, or RSF, led by his former deputy, Mohammed Hamdan Daglo. Both sides have been accused of war crimes, including targeting civilians and blocking humanitarian aid. The UN experts, including the Special Rapporteurs on the Right to Food and to Safe Drinking Water and Sanitation, demanded in a statement that both RSF and SAF Stop immediately obstructing aid delivery in Sudan. UN spokesperson Stefan Dujaric Wednesday, speaking on behalf of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, or OCHA, 
called on the warring factions to cease hostilities. OCHA calls on all parties to the conflict to stop the fighting, to protect civilians, and facilitate humanitarian access. The civil conflict in Sudan has forced some 11 million people from their homes, making it the world's worst displacement crisis. Some 25 million people, or about half the population, face severe food shortages. In May, Human Rights Watch issued a report alleging that the RSF has engaged in a campaign of ethnic cleansing against the Mosulite and other non-Arab ethnic groups in Darfur that could amount to genocide. The European Parliament has overwhelmingly passed an emergency resolution condemning the Chinese government's persecution of the Uyghur minority. The resolution urged China to immediately and unconditionally release Uyghur detainees, including economist Ilham Toti and Dr. Gulshan Abbas. The resolution is fueled by widespread concern from the international community and highlights its continued concern about the human rights situation in Xinjiang province. The resolution strongly condemns what it called China's repression and targeting of Uyghurs with abusive policies, including intense surveillance, forced labor, sterilization, birth prevention measures, and the destruction of Uyghur identity, which amounts to crimes against humanity and a serious risk of genocide. Rights groups say the Chinese government holds up to one million Uyghurs in so-called re-education camps in Xinjiang province, where their language and cultural customs are forbidden. President Joe Biden will travel to Germany Friday for meetings in Berlin with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. The trip comes as his time in office is nearing an end. Also on Biden's agenda is a meeting with other leaders in the European Quad. The group includes the United States, Britain, France and Germany. Ukraine, the Middle East War and other issues will be on the agenda. White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre said Biden's meeting with Schultz is important to him. The president believes that this uh, is felt very strongly about this trip, about one of our uh, partners, allies, that has been a, a steadfast, uh, certainly in partnership with, as it relates to Ukraine's defense. Uh, and the president really wanted to make sure to go to Germany to thank uh, Chancellor Schultz directly. Jean-Pierre describes Biden as having a, quote, close relationship with Schultz, who early this year helped broker a multi-country prisoner swap with Russia. A new report from the international anti-hunger NGO Oxfam says hunger caused by conflicts around the world have reached record high levels. The report accuses warring parties of weaponizing food and blocking aid. According to the UK-based charity, between 7,000 to as many as 21,000 people are likely dying each day from hunger in countries affected by conflict. The report was published Wednesday to coincide with World Food Day. The report, titled Food Wars, looked at 54 countries experiencing conflict. It shows that they account for nearly all of the more than 281 million people facing acute hunger today. Conflict has also been a major driver of forced displacement in conflict zones. The report says warring groups are deliberately using hunger as a weapon by targeting food, water, and energy infrastructure, as well as blocking food assistance. An independent panel investigating the attempted assassination of Donald Trump at a Pennsylvania campaign rally in July says the Secret Service needs, quote, fundamental reform. Sagar Magani reports. The panel's experts include former Homeland Security Chief Janet Napolitano, who says unless the Secret Service makes big changes. We believe another butler can and will happen again. The review echoes other findings, faulting Secret Service communications and tactics that day in Pennsylvania, but it also blasts the agency's culture, with former White House Homeland Security Advisor Francis Townsend saying the Secret Service not only must refocus on protection, but also bring in new outside leadership. They need a fresh start across the board. Sagar Magani, Washington. Britain's Foreign Secretary David Lammy is set to raise Beijing's support for Russia in Ukraine, concerns over human rights, and Hong Kong when he meets his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi tomorrow. 
Lammy is making his first trip to China since taking office, and only the second by a British foreign secretary to China in the past six years. His visit is the latest move in the Labour government's plan to step up engagement with China, and Lammy is said to view it as the start of a more consistent dialogue and regular interaction between London and Beijing. Britain views the global green transition, health, economic growth, and trade as key areas of mutual cooperation with China. China, including Hong Kong, is the UK's fourth largest trading partner. The two countries are also among the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. The Labour administration has given early indications that it will pursue a softer approach to China than the previous Conservative government. Prime Minister Keir Starmer first spoke with Chinese President Xi Jinping in August. Lammy first spoke with Wang at the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Foreign Ministers meeting in Laos in July. Starmer confirmed as Prime Minister's questions that Lammy will be directly will directly engage Chinese officials on topics like human rights, Beijing's support for Russia's war effort in Ukraine, and China's aggressive moves in the Strait of Taiwan. Google, Meta, and TikTok have removed social media accounts belonging to an industrial plant in Russia's Tatarstan region aimed at recruiting young foreign women to make drones for Moscow's war in Ukraine. Posts on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok were taken down after an Associated Press investigation published earlier this month detailed working conditions in the Alabuga Special Economic Zone, which is under U.S. and British sanctions. The young women, who are largely from Africa, said they were promised a free plane ticket to Russia and a salary of over $500 a month via the program called Alabuga Start. Some of the women said they learned only upon arriving in Tatarstan that they would be assembling Iranian-designed attack drones, They also complained of long hours under constant surveillance in unsafe working conditions. President Biden today said that a federal student loan cancellation program for public service workers has granted relief to more than one million Americans. That's up from 7,000 who were approved before it was updated by the Biden administration two years ago. President Biden said his administration restored a promise to America's teachers, firefighters, nurses, and other public servants. He celebrated it even as his broader student loan plans remain halted by courts following legal challenges by Republican-led states. The Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program was created in 2007, but until recently the vast majority of applicants were rejected because of little-known rules. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky says his government has intelligence showing that 10,000 troops from North Korea are being prepared to join Russian forces fighting against his country, warning that a third nation wading into the hostilities would turn the conflict into what he called a world war. Zelensky did not go into any further details about the claim. The Ukrainian leader's comments raised the stakes for his Western allies as he met with European Union leaders and then NATO defense ministers to discuss his victory plan to end the war with Russia. More from Charles de la Desma. Addressing EU leaders, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calls for support for his victory plan to end the devastating war with Russia. Unfortunately, we are receiving signal that China is still actively helping Russia drag out this war. And we have clear intelligence data. We need to strengthen now. The victory plan is designed for this moment, and I urge all of you to help make it happen. After talking at the EU summit, Zelensky shuttles across town to meet with NATO defence ministers. The EU's a key supporter of Ukraine, a candidate member of the 27-nation bloc, as it fights Russia's invasion that began over two and a half years ago. 
I'm Charles Dulatesma. The state of Alabama is set to carry out its fifth execution of the year for a man who was sentenced to death for a 2016 quintuple murder. Jennifer King has more. Derek Dearman received the death penalty after admitting to killing five people with an axe and a gun in 2016. Dearman dropped his appeals this year and is scheduled to be executed by lethal injection this evening at home in prison. I'm willingly giving all I can possibly give to try and repay a small portion of my debt to society for all the terrible things I've done. Audio of Dearman was sent to the Associated Press. From this point forward, I hope that the focus will not be on me, but rather the healing of all the people. His crimes took place during what he described as a meth-fueled rampage, killing his estranged girlfriend's brother, Joseph Turner, and four other family members, including a pregnant woman, at the house near Citronelle, where she had taken refuge. In an April letter to a judge, Dearman wrote, I am guilty, adding it's not fair to the victims or their families to keep prolonging the justice that they so rightly deserve. I'm Jennifer King. The number of U.S. service members and veterans who radicalize make up a tiny fraction of a percentage point of the millions and millions who have honorably served their country. But an Associated Press investigation has found that people with military backgrounds have been radicalizing at a faster rate than the general population. Donna Warder filed this report. Is this something that you want to have for, say, a small armed militia? Yes. Absolutely. Former National Guard member Chris Arthur says after leaving the service, he changed. When I came home, I realized that I no longer knew who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. Arthur would offer sessions at his farm in North Carolina on how to kidnap and attack public officials, use snipers and explosives, and create mass casualties. The number of ex-military who've been radicalized is extremely small, but University of Maryland terrorism expert Michael Jensen says there's something that separates them from extremists in the general population. They tend to veer towards the extreme violence end of the spectrum. Arthur was eventually arrested and a jury convicted him on charges relating to teaching an FBI informant how to make bombs meant to kill federal law enforcement officers, as well as illegal weapons possession. He's been sentenced to 25 years in a federal prison. I'm Donna Water. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and health professionals are urging women to get screened at earlier ages than previously suggested. Eric Tegatoff has more. After skin cancer, breast cancer is the most diagnosed form of cancer for women in the U.S. Dr. Ann Gaiman with Kaiser Permanente in Seattle says there's been an increase in breast cancer rates in women in the 40 to 50 age range. She says previous recommendations were that women should speak with their health care provider after age 40 about when to start screening. These new recommendations from the United States Preventative Services Task Force states that all women should begin screening now at age 40 and repeat screening every other year through age 74. About one in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime, according to the American Cancer Society, which also says breast cancer rates in Washington state are higher than the national average and screening rates are lower. The state has the ninth highest cancer rate in the country and the 10th lowest screening rate. Gaiman adds it isn't clear what's driving up the numbers for younger women. We don't know, but we know that younger women can get often quite aggressive forms of cancer. So these new recommendations help us to get more young women having regular screenings, which can help to intervene earlier. Gaiman says there are new treatments to target breast cancer and more research is being done because some forms are still hard to treat. But she notes some big improvements in breast cancer survival rates. A lot of that is thought to be due to the increased rates of screening because the earlier we catch breast cancer, the more treatable it is, right? If we can catch it before it's moved outside of the breast, your prognosis is much better. I'm Eric Tegadoff reporting. Africa's top public health agency says the number of MPOX-related deaths in the continent has surpassed 1,000 and warned of the continuing threat of cross-border contamination and a lack of rapid test kits. The Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says there were 50 MPOX-related deaths in the past week. That brings the total to 1,100 indicating that authorities face a challenge in stemming outbreaks currently affecting 18 of Africa's 55 nations. Mpox belongs to the same family of viruses as smallpox, 
that causes milder symptoms, including fever, chills, and body aches. People with more serious cases can develop lesions on the face, hands, chest, and genitals. A new program is offering factory farmers an alternative to the traditional factory farming industry, which can be harmful to the environment and cruel to livestock. More from Shantia Hudson. More factory farmers are breaking free from the harsh demands of the industry, with many finding a fresh start through the Transformation Project. The Transformation Project is a program led by Leah Garces of Mercy for Animals to transition to sustainable farming. Garces's passion for animal welfare started in her Florida backyard, inspiring her to become a vegetarian at 15 after watching a factory farming documentary. This path led her to work with Craig Watts, a former North Carolina chicken farmer who exposed poor conditions at Purdue Farms. So Craig and I began, we did this expose on Purdue and how Purdue were raising their chickens and calling it humanely raised in 2014 when it was not humanely raised. That ended up in the New York Times. This gave a lot of exposure to the issue. Two years later, Watts left the chicken industry and took a job with the Socially Responsible Agriculture Project. Despite quitting, he continued to pay off his debt from the chicken houses while warning other farmers not to fall for the promises of the poultry industry. Garces says that exiting factory farming isn't easy. More than 70 percent of poultry farmers live below the poverty line, burdened by massive loans. After Watts left the industry, they began exploring alternatives to farming chickens for a more sustainable income. We tear it down and repurpose the land and really experimenting and reaching out to a lot of dead ends, to so many dead ends. Then two years later, we came up with the idea of retrofitting the home, the, the warehouses into being uh, typical like greenhouses or repurposing them in some way. This exploration gave birth to the Transformation Project, which helps farmers transition to more profitable and sustainable operations. Garces says with the help of consultants, the project guides farmers in choosing the best crops for their land. Now we're encouraging farmers to either do mushrooms or microgreens. There's also tomatoes, cucumbers, and even one farmer's like changing their farm into a dog shelter and a donkey sanctuary. Another farmer's doing zinnia flowers. Like the, the joy of it is innovation is up to the farmer. Watts, who once earned five cents per pound of chicken, now earns six dollars per pound growing mushrooms. Gar says highlights that this freedom is the opposite of contract farming, where strict guidelines limit flexibility. Now, transformation is connecting other farmers with resources to pilot successful, sustainable transitions. For Public News Service, I'm Shintia Hudson. Nebraska's Farmers Union has a lot of concerns going into this year's election seeing clear differences between the candidates on issues of concern to farmers in that state. Deborah Van Fleet reports. Agriculture is the single largest industry in Nebraska and one that different administrations can impact differently. When Nebraska Farmers Union President John Hansen looks at the last two presidential administrations, he can see some of those differences while acknowledging we work with whoever gets elected. On two issues that impact agriculture, competition and climate change, Hansen sees significant differences between the Biden-Harris and former Trump-Pence administrations. In the competition arena, you got to give the Biden administration an A or A+. Plus. I give the former Trump administration somewhere between an F and a D- minus on competition issues, probably equal grades and differences in the recognition and treatment of climate change. Hansen says in 50 years of working on the issue, he's never seen an administration do more to address competition in the ag marketplace in a four-year term. When it comes to climate change, he says Trump's total denial of climate change causes him really serious concerns. Hansen calls putting more CO2 into the atmosphere tantamount to digging the hole we're in deeper, faster. We need to find creative ways to use American ingenuity and economic power to rethink energy production and maximize renewable energy development and minimize the release of stored carbon, which is what coal and oil is. Hansen has extensive experience with trade and tariffs, having been a trade advisor with a top security clearance under three presidential administrations. He says although they supported a lot of the big picture of what the Trump administration was trying to do with tariffs, it was hard to support the go-it-alone approach against China. 
because we did round up our partners and our folks who have a common interest relative to trying to rein China in, a lot of what the Trump administration tried to do was ineffective. It was ineffective because, among other things, Donald Trump doesn't even listen to his own advisors. Hinson says the Biden administration's approach to tariffs, while not perfect, has been more selective. If you're going to turn the use of a tool that has this kind of impact loose, you really do need to have an informed set of public officials that help discuss these things and help calibrate what we're doing so that we're doing things in a thoughtful and coherent way. Hansen says one of his biggest concerns for the agriculture industry currently is Congress's ongoing failure to pass a farm bill, which was a year overdue in September. For Public News Service, I'm Deborah Van Fleet. San Francisco Mayor London Breed this week strongly criticized a school district proposal to shutter or merge several public schools. In a statement, Breed said, quote, whatever this current proposed school closure process was meant to accomplish or could have accomplished is lost. Breed didn't directly criticize Superintendent Matt Wayne, but said she has lost confidence in his ability to manage the closures. Breed's statement came a week after Wayne released a tentative plan to close 11 schools, comprising eight elementary schools, one K-8, through and two high schools. Wayne did not respond specifically to Breed's statement, but posted a letter to the SFUSD community this week. Wayne has advocated for the closures given the district's declining enrollment, which over the past two decades has seen the student population decline by 14,000 seats district-wide. This has reduced the funding the district gets from the state, which is based on enrollment and attendance. The district has been overspending for years, leaving $113 million hole in the budget next year. The financial shortfall has prompted an intervention from State Superintendent of Public Instruction Tony Thurmond, who has appointed a fiscal advisor with veto power over school board spending. Massive budget cuts are expected to reduce staffing by 500 positions, which is in addition to the 1,000 jobs already cut last year, mostly through attrition. The school board is scheduled to make a final vote on any school closure recommendations in early December. Some crime victim groups are speaking out against Proposition 36 on California's November ballot. The measure would increase penalties for some theft and drug crimes and undo parts of Proposition 47, which sought to reduce prison overcrowding and reallocate funds to social services. Suzanne Potter reports. Tanish Hollins with Californians for Safety and Justice spoke Wednesday at the opening of a new trauma recovery center in Oakland. Is pushing the state to move back towards tough on crime. We are pushing back on that. You need to prioritize resources to create trauma recovery centers because this is the way that we increase safety in our communities. Supporters of Prop 36 say current laws are too lenient, particularly concerning retail theft. The state legislative analyst says Prop 36 will send many more people to jail, increasing criminal justice costs anywhere from tens of millions to the low hundreds of millions of dollars each year. Hollins says that will mean less money for programs that actually address poverty and desperation, the root causes of crime. Folks who have been touched by incarceration, the folks who are experiencing homelessness, Folks who are experiencing barriers to employment, they can actually get a full range of services to stabilize. Think about how impactful this will be if we're able to continue expanding this model. Advocates project that Prop 36 will mean $850 million less over the next decade for trauma recovery centers, mental health, drug treatment, victim services, reentry, and crime prevention programs. This is Suzanne Potter reporting. With just 19 days until the election, the presidential campaigns held rallies in Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. Democratic former President Bill Clinton was also on the campaign trail, joining Democratic vice presidential candidate Tim Walls at a rally as early voting kicks into gear in some states. Christopher Martinez reports. With just 19 days before Election Day, some people are already casting their votes, like a record 600,000 early voters in Georgia, including former President Jimmy Carter, and also in North Carolina. Now, today is the day, North Carolina. Early voting starts today. And I am proud to have voted. I voted today, as you all should vote today. 
Devin Freeman is a university senior who introduced the Democratic candidate for vice president at a rally on the first day of early voting. Presidential candidate Kamala Harris was on the trail in Wisconsin with three campaign stops. Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump was scheduled to speak at a charity dinner in the evening, and his running mate, Ohio Governor J.D. Vance, spoke at a rally in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Nineteen days until we get to say to Kamala Harris and her broken leadership, you are fired. Go back to San Francisco where you belong. Vance had praise for Donald Trump, blame for Kamala Harris, and some proposed solutions for the problems of the day, such as the high cost of groceries. And we all know, my friends, this is not rocket science. If you want to lower prices on American families, the most important thing that we need to do is unleash Pennsylvania energy workers. Drill, baby, drill. That'll lower prices for all of us. He also offered the Trump-Vance solution to the shortage of affordable housing. If you build 5 million new homes over the next three years, but you import 25 million illegal aliens, the price of housing is going to go up. Because when American homes don't go to American citizens, that is one of the biggest drivers of the increase in housing costs. So here's the simple Donald Trump plan to reduce housing costs for American citizens. Build more American homes, but make sure they go to American citizens, not people who don't have the legal right to be here. And also a solution to saving Social Security and Medicare. So while Kamala Harris wants to roll out the red carpet for illegal aliens and give them Medicare and Social Security, the message of Donald J. Trump to people who are in this country illegally is simple. Pack your bags, because in four months you're going back home. And also health care. I, I, I feel terrible for anybody who's got to take their kid to the emergency room because you're going to wait longer than three hours because there are millions of people in the United States of America who don't have the legal right to be here. Back in North Carolina, vice presidential candidate Tim Waltz spoke at a rally in Durham, North Carolina, where he drew a contrast between the harris waltz ticket and the Trump-Vance ticket. This might be the first time that both Democrats on the ticket are gun owners right now. And it might also be the first time that the guy on the other side can't pass a background check because he has felonies. Waltz boasted of Harris's record as vice president and of the support the campaign has received from a diverse array of supporters. Hundreds of Republicans out with Kamala campaigning. Who would have ever thought we would see Bernie Sanders, Dick Cheney, <laughs> and Taylor Swift on the same ticket? I'll say it again. Waltz was not alone at the rally, he was joined by what the entertainment industry calls a special guest star. The political term is surrogate. And I don't know about all of you, I'm, I'm still a little bit giddy here. I'm standing on the stage with the 42nd president of the United States. <laughs> the 42nd president was, of course, President Bill Clinton. I don't know how many more elections I'll be involved with, and I'm too old to gild the lily. Heck, I'm only two months younger than Donald Trump. Clinton said he's not running for anything anymore except for his grandchildren's future. He warned about a President Trump with new powers to go after his political enemies. I mean, basically, he's asserted the right to go after anybody that he thinks, in his wisdom, is a, is a threat, right? You sign a, the oath says you promise to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And he said, I think I'll start with domestic. <laughs> Bring me the army. As for Kamala Harris herself, she had three scheduled rallies in Wisconsin, including a rally in La Crosse. She was briefly heckled, but she had a response. Oh, you guys are at the wrong rally. <laughs> no, I think you meant to go to the smaller one down the street. All of the candidates and their surrogates urged people to vote and to get others to vote also. In North Carolina, Bill Clinton told voters they have a chance to do a lot of good for a lot of people. Your country needs you. Your families need you. Future generations need you. So, starting today, haul those people to one stop early vote and take advantage of the chance to vote early and then spend the rest of the time all the way to the election day taking other people to the polls. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez.
Berkeley voters will decide in November whether or not to tax the city's largest buildings on natural gas used for heating and cooking. Supporters of the measure say Measure GG is an important step in fighting pollution and climate change. Opponents say the measure would be an unbearable expense for small businesses, restaurants, and arts organizations. Teresa Wersbianska has the story. In 2018, the Berkeley City Council resolved to become the nation's first fossil-free city by 2045 in response to then-California Governor Jerry Brown's goal to bring the state to a carbon-neutral status by that year. But Berkeley-based climate activists like Ashley McClure say the city is not on track to meet those goals and needs to step up its game. I think it's time to stop just talking about climate solutions and actually muster the courage to pass them. And I think this is a perfect start for Berkeley to really make a more meaningful kind of step forward to addressing climate change in our own city. McClure is a Berkeley-based mom and physician who organizes with a group called Climate Health Now, which is among the coalition of eco and community activists that call themselves Fossil Free Berkeley. Fossil Free Berkeley put climate health on the front burner, so to speak, by bringing to the Berkeley voters in November a ballot measure that would impose a tax on natural gas consumption of the city's largest buildings. The Large Buildings Fossil Fuel Emissions Tax Ordinance, or Measure GG, would, if passed, tax non-exempt buildings that are over 15,000 square feet, charging them just under $3 per therm of natural gas used with a 6% annual increase. The goals of the measure are to de-incentivize natural gas use for heating or cooking among the city's largest polluters by encouraging them to switch to electricity. Tax funds generated by the measure would then pay for further efforts to reduce natural gas consumption in homes and businesses. Methane, one of the largest components of natural gas, is a greenhouse gas that has proven deleterious effects on both the environment and human health. Ashley McClure. There's nothing natural or benign about natural gas, so the more we get off of it and electrify. This is about keeping our kids and communities healthy. According to a Fossil Free Berkeley report, the city emitted approximately 160,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide from methane gas combustion in commercial and residential buildings in 2021. And that's not accounting for the substantial leakage of methane, which pollutes the air. But it's not only outside air pollution and the greenhouse effect that worry Fossil Free Berkeley. It's also the personal health risks associated with natural gas use. A recent Danish study links childhood asthma cases with living in homes that use gas for cooking and heating. Brianna McGuire is a researcher at UC Davis who has been working to support the measure. She says upgrading to greener appliances isn't just something people want to do in Berkeley. It's something they will have to do following another recent rule by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District that would require homeowners to replace defunct gas appliances with electric alternatives. People are going to have to start installing new electric appliances all over the city very soon. Um, Some of those folks are very low income. Some of the buildings that are going to need to comply are going to need help because not only are they going to need to buy the appliances, they need to rewire their homes. And so we wanted to raise money to help with that. Supporters of the measure say it's a win-win for the city. 98% of residents would see no change to their utility bills. More residents could access greener appliance upgrades. And a handful of large polluters would be forced to either shape up or foot the bill. The number of buildings affected amounts to exactly 609 and excludes any state buildings, including the University of California, which are exempt, or residential apartment buildings that hold affordable units. Opponents to the measure include some of Berkeley's most beloved nonprofits and small businesses, including Alta Bates Hospital, the Berkeley Rep Theater, Boy Chick Bagels and Acme Bread, which run commercial bakeries in the city. These businesses and nonprofits may own or rent space in large buildings, but critics of the measure say labeling them as large polluters may be misguided, and the hefty gas tax may be an unbearable burden to already strapped budgets. On a busy corner of Shattuck and Addison in downtown Berkeley's Arts District, Revival Bar and Kitchen features no on GG flyers in the window and at the host stand. Chef and owner Amy Murray opened the sprawling 6,000-square-foot restaurant in 2010. 
She doesn't own the building. She rents the space within the larger property, which exceeds 15,000 square feet. We all want to do something about climate change, and we all want the cleanest energy available to us, but there's a lot of problems with the way Measure GG is written. For one thing, the gas bill goes to her and not her landlord. And for another thing, she argues it's not fair. If she rented the same space in a smaller building, she wouldn't be impacted. But because she rents in a large building, she's worried about being able to make the bills. Gas went up to $5 a therm in January of 2024, and that was frightening because we saw our PG&E bills spike to $6,000, $7,000, $8,000, which just means we can't operate. Measure GG stipulates that buildings will see the tax in 2026 based on their 2025 usage. Murray says Measure GG seems to be attacking vulnerable organizations who are already struggling. Almost everyone who's going to be impacted by this is either a school, a hospital, a theater, a restaurant. And most of us are just barely hanging on since 2020. We can't take on another huge price increase and expect to survive. Measure GG follows a 2019 attempt in Berkeley to ban gas hookups in new construction, which failed after the Restaurant Association challenged its legality. I'm Teresa Wersbianska, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. The Virginia Passenger Rail Authority is leading efforts to modernize and expand that state's passenger rail system with significant projects underway to separate passenger and freight rail service. More from Tramel Gomes. DJ Statler with the Rail Authority is touting what he hopes to be a game-changing effort to separate passenger and freight services and build state-owned rail infrastructure. He thinks current plans will lead to better on-time performance and increased reliability for both freight and passenger trains. We're purchasing a lot of the rail between Washington and, and really North Carolina, so we have dedicated passenger track. Only passenger trains will go on our track that we own. The freight track the traffic will stay on the freight lanes. Virginia's rail modernization comes as part of a broader national effort. The Biden-Harris administration recently announced more than $1 billion in funding for passenger rail improvements, and VPRA is applying for more grants under the federal-state partnership for intercity passenger rail program, with applications due in December. The Rail Authority's ambitious plans aim to make passenger rail a more attractive option for for Virginians, an incremental improvement leading to a more comprehensive rail system by 2030. By 2027, Statler says Virginians will also see the introduction of Amtrak's aero equipment, modern train sets designed for improved energy efficiency and better passenger experience. The engines are dual mode, so you'll be having the same engine in DC that's electric when you get there instead of taking that engine off the conductor the engineer will just hit a button the electric pantograph will go down the diesel engine will light up boom and then we'll continue southbound so it'll be a much smoother trip as part of this future vision the number of daily round trips between Richmond and Washington DC will increase from 5 to 13 with nearly hourly service by 2030 in August Virginia officials approved a deal with Norfolk Southern to expand passenger rail services extending trains from Rowan to Christiansburg in the New River Valley. This is Tramel Gomes. Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao delivered her State of the City address last night. Tao faces a recall in the November election. She said crime is down in Oakland despite an $80 million budget deficit. She said the sale of the Oakland Coliseum will address that shortfall. This sale will bring in $125 million with $110 million within this fiscal year and leads a multi-billion dollar development in East Oakland. This investment, I want to be clear, into the deep east is long overdue, decades overdue. And I am honored to be in the position to bring this community-led vision to reality. Look, I want to be clear that this deal is never going to be a silver bullet to solve our decades-long budgetary issues. I am willing to work with community and city staff, but I am not willing to stand by idly while we are facing cuts to our police and fire resources. The mayor also attended a rally with business owners who oppose the recall against her. Meanwhile, embattled Oakland Mayor Shang Tao joined climate and faith leaders at American Steel in Oakland to discuss the city's green industry. 
while urging voters to oppose the recall against her this November. Jose Velasquez reports. Mayor Shang Tao linked the financial backers of her recall to the same corporate interests that she said have opposed climate initiatives in the city. Tao warned that the recall would allow coal money to undermine democracy in Oakland. This is the crossroads in regards to what we decide to do in regards to the recall. We either decide to allow for coal to buy the seats of elected officials, or we carry on with the strong legacy in the city of Oakland that we cannot be bought and that we're going to stay firm on stating no coal in Oakland. Tao said the recall effort is being led by Philip Dreyfus, a hedge fund investor who does not live in Oakland. According to the independent newsroom Oakland side, Dreyfus is the primary financial contributor to the recall campaign, donating $605,000. Tao said Dreyfus has significant investments in the fossil fuel industry. This whole recall is run by one executive hedge fund. That one executive hedge fund lives in Piedmont. That one executive hedge fund and his company has invested $2 billion. No, I did not make a mistake by saying billion. $2 billion just this year into coal across the whole world. Mayor Shang Tao said supporters of the recall effort are trying to create fear and instability by misrepresenting the progress her administration has made in combating crime and fostering the city's growth. Tao noted that for the first time since 2019, Oakland is on track to record fewer deaths than in previous years. In Oakland, I'm Jose Velasquez, Pacifica Radio, KPFA. The Biden administration announced temporary legal status for Lebanese citizens already in the United States. The Homeland Security Department said that today's announcement, together with an earlier offer in July, brings to about 11,000 the number of Lebanese who will be able to stay in the country and become eligible for work authorization. The offer is for people already in the United States as of today, and it is for a period of 18 months. The department says temporary protected status will allow Lebanese citizens to stay while the United States pursues a, quote, diplomatic solution for lasting stability and security across the Israel-Lebanon border. The state and national Republican parties are appealing a judge's ruling that said seven election rules recently passed by Georgia's state election board are, quote, illegal, unconstitutional, and void. The Republicans want to overturn a ruling from Fulton County Superior Court Judge Thomas Cox, who on Wednesday ruled that the board did not have the authority to pass the rules. Cox ordered the board to immediately inform all state and local election officials that the rules are void and not to be followed. The invalidated rules include three that had gotten a lot of attention. One requires that the number of ballots be hand-counted after the close of polls, and two others deal with certification of election results. Much of the Bay Area is under a red flag warning today because of high winds expected to arrive overnight. The so-called Diablo wind is expected to whip across Northern California and cause humidity levels to drop and raise wildfire danger. Pacific Gas and Electric says it's prepared to turn off power to a small number of customers in areas with strong wind gusts. Clear tonight in the Bay Area, lows tonight in the 50s. Tomorrow, sunny, highs in the 70s. In the central San Joaquin Valley, clear tonight, overnight lows in the 50s. Tomorrow, sunny, highs in the 70s. That's it for the news. I'm Max Springle with Scott Baba. Rod Akeels at the controls. Good evening. could scroll social media to get your election news, or you could tune in to 94.1 KPFA, or Berkeley's community radio, keeping you in the know and giving you a break from the noise with hand-picked music that relaxes and refreshes. Informed? Check. Relaxed? Definitely. But none of that happens without you. We rely on listener support to stay on the air. So visit kpfa.org slash donate and pitch in. 
We'll handle the news. You just focus on keeping calm. You're listening to The Coffee Up, 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF Fresno, 97.5 K248BR Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FC Monterrey, online kpfa.org.